Alexi, Alexi, are, are you, you ready, ready to, to take, take the stage? stage? Yeah. yeah. Welcome, Welcome to the stage, stage Alexi, please, guys, for Bitcoin, Bitcoin Bridges. Bridges. All right. So, so hey, I'm Alexi. Alexi. I'm one of the two co-founders of Interlay. We're a project, project that tries to build a decentralized financial wrapper on top and around of Bitcoin. Um, I've, I've been working on trying to bring BDC to other networks in a decentralized manner for the co last couple of years. Um, and, and today I'll talk about Bitcoin bridges and whether they're a cure or a curse to Bitcoin. Um, the content of this talk stems from my PhD that I did in London and really kind of looking into the problems of, you know, bridging between different chains and what this means for Bitcoin. So uh, the goal for this talk is that at the end you'll know how to wrap or bridge Bitcoin to other networks, um, like how it works, what the challenges are, why this process is very, very difficult and ideally how we can build a decentralized bridge for Bitcoin. So let's first address the elephant in the room. Why should you even care about bridging Bitcoin to other chains, right? So whether or not you're personally interested in what's going on in other networks, there's definitely a, a lot, lot of people, people doing, doing that, that right? right? There's, there's a, critical a critical mass, mass and a lot, lot of innovation, innovation development happening on other networks, networks. And, and definitely a lot of people have bridged the Bitcoin over. So at its peak, around 437,000 BTC was moved to the networks. networks. Um, now, now, if you, if you look, look at this number today, it's much, much less. less. Some, Some of these things have been wiped out because they were centralized. centralized. Um, but, but that's a multi-billion dollar market, market that's fully controlled by a few centralized providers. And, and people, people don't know, and that's, that's the biggest problem. problem. Um, because, because if you look, look at the numbers, numbers how much of that 400,000 Bitcoin do you think is decentralized? In the sense of, you know, the bridging process. Well, well, close. It's, it's 0.5%, and that's, and that's really being generous to the few to the projects that have actually try to be decentralized. So, so it's, it's really, really it's, it's, it's a nice, but it's a meme, right? So, so, so DeFi for Bitcoin, unfortunately, on other networks, it, it's great if you could have a decentralized bridge, but for now, it's more of a meme because in the end, it's, it's centralized and you trust the bridge operator instead of the next exchange. Right, so let's talk about bridges and what that actually means. So what do we actually want to achieve when we bridge Bitcoin to another protocol or network. We actually want to do something there, right? There must be a reason why we take up this extra risk. So we want to do something with an application. And the process should look very similar to what you do on a centralized exchange. You deposit Bitcoin into something or somewhere. Let's, say, let's call it an app chain, application chain. Um, and you use Bitcoin there. And you can use this Bitcoin with whatever, with whatever apps or services are provided there. And it's supported just like any other native assets. So think of, again, you depo deposit into an exchange. You don't, you don't care how exactly things are structured, you can just use it to trade, whatever. And then, and then you, you want, want to get Bitcoin back. When, when you're, you're finished using it, you want to be sure that you can get it out. out. So the goal is simple UX and actual security because you would like to recover your Bitcoin. Now, now let's, let's look at trust models. models. So when, when we use Bitcoin, Bitcoin, what do we actually care about and what do we need? You need a Bitcoin wallet as a user, right? I know like developers, you can use a phone node and everything, but the normal user will use a wallet. And they will trust that the Bitcoin network is secure, which is an easy one. And they will trust that the wallet is secure, right? Because obviously the wallet could have a bug in there, well, their money could be lost. How do they verify? Well, they verify because ideally the wallet side is also open source, there's enough people using it, and they trust the critical mass of the community that they've checked. Now, when you go to other chains, you extend your trust model. You now trust that Bitcoin, uh, you need a Bitcoin wallet, and you need a wallet on another chain because you somehow need to interact with that thing. And, and you need, need a way, way to bridge this gap. gap. You, need to, you need a way, need a way to, to get, get the Bitcoin, Bitcoin over. And, and what you trust is you trust the Bitcoin, Bitcoin network, you trust this other network, network. and these, these, are, these are easy, right? right? Because if, if you, you wouldn't trust, let's say, Ethereum, you, you wouldn't go there. there. There's, There's no, no point of depositing your money into Ethereum or any other chain if you think it's going to fail tomorrow. But then you also trust that these two wallets are corrupted, not only your Bitcoin one, but also the wallet that you're using on the other chain. And, and you're, you're trusting, trusting that the bridge is not corrupted. And that's the weakest link, right? right? The bridge can be, and in most cases will be centralized. And that's, that's essentially where things will or can go wrong. Um, and, and the way, way to verify is, again, hopefully, hopefully everything is open source. And if it's not, then at least, well, you should look at the reputation of the bridge, right? So that's what you can do. If the bridge code is not open source, you can check, well, are people using it? Can they get in and get out? And then you can, you know, make an assessment whether this is reliable enough for you. So, so, the, the problem, problem that we that actually face is that Bitcoin, Bitcoin obviously only exists on the Bitcoin blockchain. blockchain. So, so to, to get, get it over, you need to do a process called wrapping. 
Um, it's, it's a, a fancy, fancy term, term, but essentially what it means is you create a copy, a representation of Bitcoin on this other network, and it's obviously hopefully one-to-one -one backed, and this allows you to move that around. So this thing is actually a certificate that points to this Bitcoin that you've locked on the Bitcoin chain, and whoever owns the certificate or parts of it should be able to claim your Bitcoin or the parts of that Bitcoin. So the analogy is... Think, think of how you would trade a barrel of oil on the stock exchange. You won't drag that into the room and you know ask people to, to buy it. You put it in with you deposit it with a broker or a vault somewhere, get a digital certificate, and then you'll trade that. And ideally, in theory, if somebody would want to redeem that certificate for the barrel, they'll get pieces of it or whatever. I mean it's a very simplified analogy, but that's essentially the concept. In computer science terms, it the same can be described as obtaining a write lock on the state of the UTXO, which will typically be ownership, and then making sure that whatever changes that we've made on the other chain are reapplied on Bitcoin before we release the lock and make any further updates. Which means is if I trade my wrapped Bitcoin to somebody else, this other person should be able to get the actual BDC back on the Bitcoin chain. Well, the question is, it sounds very simple, but so why is it so, so difficult to make this trustless? And why is it so hard? Why do we still rely on centralized providers? And to understand this, we need to go back a long, long, long time, time to, to one, one of the, the oldest problems in, in commerce, the, the fair exchange problem. problem. And, and I'll, I'll explain, explain to you why this is relevant in a moment, so bear with me. me. So, so let's, let's assume again, again we have Alice, Alice, we have Bob. Alice, Alice wants to buy an apple, apple Bob wants, wants the money. money. What, what do they do? Well, they'll meet somewhere and exchange the goods. Um, and, and ideally, ideally they'll, they'll meet in a public place, place right? Because if they, they don't, don't know each other, they don't trust each other, they won't go to a dark alleyway where Bob may rob Alice, right? right? And, and if, if anyone has ever bought anything on Gumtree, you probably know the feeling, right? You don't know the person, probably won't meet somewhere in, in the woods. Um, well, if you do this in a digital manner, then it becomes even more difficult because on the internet, well, you don't know who the person is. And if you're working with Bitcoin, people are typically quite cautious about the privacy. You don't know who this account belongs to. Um, and essentially, someone has to make the first move. Someone has to make the first transfer. And that's the biggest challenge. And it burns down to the fact that you need to trust a trusted third party. Someone or something needs to ensure that if Alice and Bob interact, that they can't really steal from one another. Um, and this is actually a very old problem. Obviously, Obviously, not only in computer science, science but, but for, for those of you who are interested, interested there's, there's a very interesting paper from 1999, 1999 that formalizes this and explains why it's so difficult. Um, so, so how, how does this all relate to bridges? bridges? Well, well, if, if you're wrapping an asset, if you're bridging Bitcoin to another chain, you're wrapping it, and you're trading your Bitcoin for that wrapped asset, even if it's temporary. Well, it might be permanent if, you, if that bridge breaks. Um, and if, when you're going back, you're swapping that wrapped asset for Bitcoin. And, and someone, someone needs, needs to make sure that this locking and unlocking actually works. Um, also, also, coin swaps, swaps right? right? If, if we have time, we can cover that at the end, but the atomic coin swaps are a cross-chain way to exchange two assets, assets, and that's even more clear how this relates to fair exchange, right? Because you're literally exchanging assets with somebody else, not with yourself as in wrapping. So, so if you look at the cross-chain problem now and forget about apples and so on, what Alice would like to do, Alice would like to wrap her Bitcoin. And she, she wants to do this, obviously, um, each time she locks her Bitcoin. So if she locks her Bitcoin, she needs to be sure that she'll get the wrapped asset. And Bob, and Bob can be one person or the entire network of, of Ethereum, for example. Bob wants to make sure, well, that Alice only gets the wrapped asset if she locked her Bitcoin. And the challenge is, well, how do we make sure that it's atomic? So either both happen or none of them. And the challenge of bridging is hence the challenge of selecting the most suitable third party depending on what you want to achieve and on your trust models. If you're exchanging and bridging between two exchanges, well, okay, it's centralized. You don't need to build a decentralized network on top of that. But if you're bridging between Bitcoin and another hopefully decentralized network, well, you can trust a centralized provider. Like in the case of RAPBTC, you trust BigGo. Um, you can trust a federation, which is a group of people. So it's not one person, but it's a public group of entities that have multisig, multi um, as, as in, in the, the case, case, for example, um, of the liquid BDC or the RSK bridge. bridge. But, but again, again, still, you're trusting this group of people. people they might collude. You, you don't know, know right? And, and it's not always easy to extend or exchange people in that committee without moving the funds between multisigs, and it's not that easy to manage. Well, where it becomes interesting is you could 
instead of a multi-sig, and that's, that's fixed size, you could use another network. You could try to plug in something that is hopefully also decentralized, where anybody can join and leave, and basically you add, let's call it exchange chain or bridge chain, whatever, between Bitcoin and Ethereum, and that thing has thousands of users and nodes ideally, and the only thing they do is make sure that the bridging works. But again, it's a third-party network, and you now you're adding another trust vector to your equation, right? You trust Bitcoin, you trust Ethereum, and now you trust this other thing again, which you might not want to. So the ideal scenario, right, is that we only trust Bitcoin and Ethereum because that's the bare minimum if we go to another network. So the ideal case is that we use the consensus of the involved chains. And again, unfortunately, this doesn't work in practice with Bitcoin, but the ideal scenario would be that Ethereum verifies Bitcoin SPV proofs. So the Ethereum chain as a whole the miners or stakers in Ethereum can verify that specific Bitcoin transactions have happened. And vice versa, that the Bitcoin miners and full nodes could verify that Ethereum transactions have happened. And then in this case, you would only need one honest node to, and this could be anyone in this room or all of us, who just relay these proofs. And you can see this image on the right, on the right side. This is actually from 2014 from the sidechains paper by Adam Back and the rest of the team. Um, so we've known how to do this for a long, long time. Um, so, so the, the problem, problem is that, that um, well, that, that doesn't, doesn't really work for Bitcoin. Bitcoin. So, so Bitcoin, Bitcoin does, does not, not know what happens on other networks, and we definitely probably don't want to start adding like lines for all these different chains because we're polluting the Bitcoin code, these things change, they break, and also, like, and if you say, okay, we're only going to do one, which chain do you pick? So it's a very difficult question, and it's not going to work. So, so this, this is, is why bridging, bridging from Bitcoin, Bitcoin to another chain is actually very difficult. difficult. You need someone, not something in this case, but someone to handle the locking and unlocking of BDC based on events on the other network. So whenever somebody wants to go back, you need to unlock it reliably. And how most centralized bridges, and or most bridges today unfortunately work, is that, well, you have a centralized issuer. You have some centralized entity where you have to go and you give them the Bitcoin and you have to plead and ask, hey, could I get a wrapped asset? And if they're nice, they'll give it to you. And if you want to go back, same process, you return the wrapped asset, they see that you've returned it, and they'll hopefully give you your Bitcoin. But obviously, you have zero remedy and protection if, that, if they don't want to. And it doesn't mean that this is a bad company or a bad entity, right? They could go bankrupt, they may be breached, they might have a very poor um, cold, hot, uh, cold and hot wallet management, and they just lose your Bitcoin. And, well, that's, that's it, your Bitcoin's gone. gone. And, and it's, it's not theoretical. theoretical. We've had Solana BTC basically depeg because it, it broke, or essentially the, the Bitcoin was gone because it was owned by FTX. You had RAM BTC, which was a centralized bridge from Bitcoin to Ethereum, to shut down within a month. Notice because, well, FTX had acquired the team a while ago, so and nobody knows what's going to happen next. And yes, even shutting down within a month's notice is bad because a lot of people need to scramble to get the Bitcoin out of the system. So, so we, we see, see these things, things in practice, practice and you, you, you do, do wonder, well, how long will we tolerate and how long will users trust these things? And unfortunately, even if today we don't have 400,000 Bitcoin locked in the essentialized bridges, it's still around 200,000, 300,000. So it's still a lot of money that is basically locked up and depends on centralized services and people still call it DeFi. So how do we build a decentralized bridge without changing Bitcoin, obviously? So the first step we'll do is, well, let's replace the centralized provider with a decentralized network. Let's allow anybody to become this bridge operator. Sounds great. Now it's decentralized, it's censorship resistant, perfect. But that actually is even worse, because now instead of Big Go, which is a publicly known entity, it's in the US, you could sue them, you now have random people on the internet that you're going to send your Bitcoin to and hope that they will at some point return it. Well, that doesn't really work. So what we, we do, do is we sprinkle in the two things that actually make Bitcoin work in the entire industry, right? You add incentives and you add punishment. You require that these bridge operators, whoever they are, that they lock up collateral. They're over collateralized in whatever other assets you have available on Ethereum. So it could be USD stable coins, ETH, whatever you consider as value, right? Doesn't, they can't accept Bitcoin because, well, that target chain does not have BTC. Um, and punishment you will punish misbehaving operators. If they lose your Bitcoin, they'll get liquidated. The system will take their collateral and give it to users. Sounds good. So if we walk through this step by step, um, and this is, the, on, this is on the example of InterBTC, something that we actually built. Um, but 
this can be instantiated between any two projects, any two chains in theory. So what you do is, as a vault operator, and again, this could be anyone in this room, you can run some software to automate this, you can do it manually. Um, you register as a vault and you deposit different assets as collateral. And the amount of money that you put in de determines how much Bitcoin you will be able to receive from users. And the equation here is simple. The value of the BTC needs to be less than the value of the collateral, because otherwise, again, you'd be, able, you'd, be, you'd be incentivized to steal, which we want to prevent. So as a user, I will deposit my BTC into these vaults, that will lock, lock up their collateral, collateral and, and I'll, I'll get my wrapped BTC, BTC asset. asset. Great. Great, and now, now I, I can use it, it and I'm happy. Because, because I, know I know that, that okay, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is with these vaults, I mean, it's, it's locked, locked, but in theory they could steal it, right? right. So, so it's, it's still kind of custodial, custodial and there's, there's no way around this. But if they do misbehave, I have a claim on their collateral. collateral. So, so if, if, if everything goes fine, I, want, I go back, I get my Bitcoin out, the vaults receive their collateral back, everyone's happy. But if the vaults are bad, I have a claim on their collateral, I automatically can take that, and now I have different assets which I can go sell in the secondary market. And these liquidations happen with a premium. So it's not at a one-to-one -one rate to Bitcoin, it's actually at, let's say, 5% premium, similar to how lending markets work, right? If you liquidate someone, there's a small premium for you to, well, go and, and recover the assets. So the last part that is missing here is how do we determine that you know, the vaults misbehaved? How, how do we know? How does the other chain actually react to that? And that's, again, where these SPV like clients come in. So what you do is you deploy a Bitcoin like client directly as part of the chain, whether it's part of its consensus, a smart contract, whatever. This thing will track Bitcoin block headers and verify that certain transactions are included, just like your mobile phone. So, you know, when you have a mobile wallet, that thing typically doesn't download the entire Bitcoin chain, it only downloads the block headers that contain metadata, and it accepts transaction inclusion proofs, which are basically Merkle tree paths, which prove that your transaction hash is actually in the Merkle tree of transactions of that specific block. And that's exactly what this thing does. The security assumption is, if a block is included in the main chain, so you typically wait for sufficient confirmations, so if it's included in the main chain, where it can be, we can be very certain that it's a valid block because, well, some amount, like six confirmations or whatever have passed, so somebody would have to create a fork of Bitcoin and attack Bitcoin to actually attack the thing. Same security model as any mobile wallet. Um, but the difference is that someone needs to keep this up to date, and whereas mobile wallets have to look for nodes, this is public. So anyone, any full node, any operator, anyone in this room can start submitting block headers to this and check, hey, is this actually aware of the cor correct Bitcoin state? So it's a public like client, essentially. Um, and, and, well, where, where do we plug this in? You plug this in in, in step one, one where, where the user is actually minting the wrapped BDC because the user also needs to prove that they actually sent the Bitcoin. You don't want users claiming and making false claims on, on wrapped assets. You want to make sure that you only get the wrapped asset if you deposited the Bitcoin, and you require this for vaults um, before they can claim back their collateral after they hopefully successfully repay the Bitcoin. If the vaults in step three fail to submit the proof, liquidation. And that's it, that's how you build a decentralized bridge. You, so in summary, your issuer is a smart contract or it's a consensus of the chain you want to go to, so it needs to be enforced by consensus. You have a permissionless network of vaults, or you can call them whatever, operators, and the goal is that anyone can join ideally. These operators or vaults are over collateralized. So otherwise, otherwise incentives, incentives break and they, they might be incentivized to steal a Bitcoin. Bitcoin. And, and the verification, verification of correct, correct behavior happens using like clients. So, so you actually know you, they, they, they cannot lie to the system because, because you can, can always prove that they misbehaved. What we left out in this design is a few things, things right? So, so liquidations, liquidations is obviously one point. point. What, what happens, happens if I'm a vault operator and I have one Bitcoin and I've collateralized this with dollars and then the Bitcoin price shoots up? Obviously now, if I don't do anything, at some point the Bitcoin price will be so high that I've locked, locked up less dollars than the Bitcoin I hold. So, so what the system will do, it will give you two options as an operator. Either you top up, or let's say at 110% collateralization rate, so I've got 110% worth of my Bitcoin dollars. If I've done nothing, I'll be liquidated automatically. I can keep the Bitcoin, but I've lost 10%. And then somebody can go take that and, and basically repay my loan. So somebody can, instead of me putting Bitcoin into the system, rebalance and take the 10% profit just, just like, like in lending, lending markets. markets. So, so it's, it's essentially, essentially very similar, similar to that. that.
Um, then actually, actually the third point, point skipping the, the second one for a moment, moment. Well, well, how, how do, we do we know when to liquidate and how do we know if the Bitcoin price is changing? And that's essentially the weakest point of this entire system. You need to know what the Bitcoin is worth. So ideally, you would use the centralized exchanges and so on. But today, nowadays, they're still quite you know, subjective to manipulation because the volumes are low. So you essentially need a network of, of Oracle data providers that will feed information into this thing, telling them about, well, what's the Bitcoin price on Coinbase, on Binance, on Uniswap, and so on. Um, Coinbase is starting to sign their feeds. Hopefully, they will start, more exchanges will start doing that so you have more reliable information about the markets. Um, but that essentially is the weakest link of the system. Um, and something more technical, you need to figure out how to map deposits with Bitcoin transactions. You could use op returns, so including some arbitrary data um, in Bitcoin transactions, but that actually is bad because no wallet really supports this. And you don't want users trying to you know, figure out how to build custom transactions. So what you actually would do, and that's what we implemented, is you derive the deposit addresses from the operator's public key, and, and you, you do, do essentially, essentially what HD wallets, wallets do, but for each deposit. deposit. So you, you kind of avoid adding. adding. You, you basically try to make sure that any normal wallet, any Bitcoin transaction can work and be compatible with the system, because in the end, it should not require technical skills from users, because otherwise you're blocking adoption. Now, there's tons of things we can do in terms of extensions and flavors, and I'm going to wrap up because I'm running out of time, but you can use multisigs, trust, you can use different collateral models, and, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, but last thing before we go to questions is, well, that's great. We learned how to build essentialized bridges without changing Bitcoin. What if we could change it? Well, there's tons of stuff you could do, but in the end, you can be summarized in you'd need miners to enforce the bridging, one way or the other. As mentioned, it's kind of difficult. It's a difficult problem to solve because, well, wh which, which light lines do we implement? Every chain has a, chains have different proof of work algorithms, like S script on Litecoin even, or in our proof of stake, which keeps changing, and then light lines for Ethereum are actually insecure, as we just re recently learned. So it's a very tough problem. Um, there are two BIPs, um, BIP 300, BIP 301, that kind of go in that direction. BIP 300 would allow miners to vote on peg in and peg out transactions. Um, so, yeah, so if you're, you're interested, interested do, do check it out. out. There's, There's also, also a website called Layer 2 Labs. Labs. They, they now found the company, company and trying to kind of, you know, educate, educate more people about this option. option. Um, but, but this, this does, does involve quite controversial changes to the Bitcoin, Bitcoin consensus, which is unlikely to happen in, in the near future, but let's see. So in conclusion, bridges are a cure in the sense that it unlocks more use cases to Bitcoin without adding changes to the Bitcoin chain itself and affecting its security. There is high demand for this, as we've seen. I mean, look at centralized exchanges, how much Bitcoin isn't there. And, and arguably, even, even if we're not all fans of different chains, chains arguably, if a network is sufficiently decentralized, it's much more secure than an opaque exchange like FTX. Like FTX. The curse is, well, 99% of these bridges are centralized, so it kind of defeats the entire purpose. Many of these actually advertise themselves as being decentralized or not custodial, which makes it even worse because they're lying to users. And decentralization is hard because, and it comes at a cost. So you have this capital that is locked up as, as collateral, and, and it's, it's not cheap. cheap. So, so obviously, a centralized bridge is always going to be cheaper, and there's, there's going to be a price that you'll have to pay for decentralization. So likely higher fees or continuous fees to keep your Bitcoin on other networks if you want this insurance of collateral. Um, last note, there are no non-custodial bridges. So if somebody tells you they built a non-custodial bridge, they're lying to you. That doesn't work. You can't lock up your Bitcoin in a multisig and have control over that and then expect, expect to be able to, to trade it to somebody else, else right? Because, because if, I, if, I, if I lock up my Bitcoin in a multisig and I trade it to, let's say, Bob, and Bob wants to go back, he has to ask me for permission on the Bitcoin blockchain, and there's nothing to enforce me to actually you know, up in my multisig. There are ways, and there's a lot of research in that direction, but it's, it might be the holy grail, it might actually not be possible. But if you're interested to read up on the latest work, um, we actually released a paper a few months ago that kind of goes in that direction. But, but it's still, still like, it, it, this works, works more, more for things, things like, if you, you give up on fungibility, it becomes some form of NFT. Um, you, you can't really trade it that easily, easily but, but for things where you don't need to, you know, trade Bitcoin frequently and just lock it up somewhere, it might be interesting. And, and with that, thanks so much and happy to take questions. 
Ah, last, last one. one. If, if you, you do, do want to try out the decentralized bridge, bridge we've, we've, we've built, built one and it's been operational for a year. It's done around 10 to 12 million dollars in volume over the last few months. Not great, not terrible, so it's slowly kind of people are experimenting. Um, you can go to app.info.io, but please do your research. You'll be bridging to the network, you've learned about the risks, so you need to be sure that you, you should have a reason to use that, right? If you want to use it for, let's say, lending, okay, you can try it, then try it out. Great talk. Um, if we had to choose one, would it be curse? Or cure. cure. Choose one. Uh, I didn't, I didn't think, think about, about that. Uh, so, so right now, now probably curse. Okay. Hopefully, Hopefully we, we can, can make, make it a cure by decentralizing it. it. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks for the talk. talk. Um, with, with the over collateralization on the secondary, secondary chain, chain, is there a risk of like a market, market manipulation attack where the collateral, collateral currency is going to be presumably easier to manipulate than Bitcoin. So you could inflate that price, use it as collateral, become a vault, get a bunch of Bitcoin, and then you have Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's, that's a very, very good point. point. Yes, yes, of course. course. Like, like if, if your collateral, collateral is bad, well then, then, then the bridge is not secure. secure. So, so for example, this is why you would never use, like, like if you're a small network, network you should never put your native token as collateral because what's the first thing that will drop in value if the bridge is struggling? Your native as your native token. And, and if you, you have, have it as collateral, collateral and you start liquidating people and throwing more of that token onto the market because users will be selling it, you get another Luna, death spiral, right? right? So, so yes, absolutely. And this is why you need to do proper risk analysis, analysis just like as if you were a lending protocol. Because, because realistically, it works like a lending mechanism. mechanism. So you need to do proper risk assessment. If it's a low liquidity and high risk collateral asset, you need to impose very high collateralization rates. So you should use it with blue chip assets where possible. But then what are blue chip assets? Can you kind of ETH? On Ethereum, Ethereum, and then, well, maybe it's decentralized stable coins, coins, but again, DAI is, is kind of basically USDC. USDC, fair enough, fair enough but that's centralized, so, so that, that gets shut down and also breaks. So, you, you know, you have, have to work with, you have, with what, what you have. have. But, but yeah, yeah, ideally, we'll, we'll have, have more decentralized assets, assets in the long run, but it's kind of a chicken egg problem because that's what Bitcoin is for. You want to get it over, but you need something to secure. Great question, great answer. And there's one over, who was it? Sorry. So, so would, would you say, say that the weakest, weakest link in terms of this collateral is the easiest to manipulate asset that is allowed? Because, because I guess the smart contract on each chain has some whitelist of, of collaterals, and whatever is the weakest form of collateral could be manipulated to crash the whole market on one chain or even with bridges like collapse across all the chains. So so, so it would so it would actually only affect the vaults that so it only affect the parts of the bridge. So what you do is like in a multi-collateral system, you set ceilings. So let's say you allow, let's say a million dollars worth of USDT and 100K of some weird token. You shouldn't do that. But that weird token will also have a collateralization rate of like 500%, right? Or 200%, like really conservative. And even if that breaks, you have a ceiling of how much Bitcoin was backed by this. And then yes, then that part will depeg. Overall, it's not great. You will lose some, people will lose some money, unfortunately. Ideally, your, the, the network and the vaults and the whole system has built up a treasury throughout over the time to be able to recover that. But yeah, so the weakest link is, your, it's always the weakest link. So it's, if you have at a very bad local liquidity token as collateral, you shouldn't do that. You, you need proper risk management by the smart contract. You need people to vote on what's, in, like do proper risk management. Um, and um, of course, oracles, right? So even with MakerDAO on Ethereum, we saw that if the, if the oracles mess up, that's bad. So that's that's essentially the thing that unfortunately, you know, if we could solve the oracle problem, that would be great. But that's just as hard as bridging. So you kind of end up. Um, well, that's as far as you can go, essentially. Cool. I think we've got time for one quick question at the back there. I just would like your opinion on Sovereign's sidechain approach, approach with, with RPTC. RPTC. Are, you Are you familiar with that? that? Yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. Can I have your opinion about that, how the bridge works? So, so, so I actually mentioned, mentioned so, so RPTC, RPTC is a federated bridge. So, so you have, have a multi-sig of, 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 of basically a few entities, and you have, you have to trust these entities. entities. That, that's, that's how the bridge works. works. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, really, really great, great talk. talk. Can we have a round of applause for Alexi? Alexi?